Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to another beautiful Sunday morning here uh, on the mountain. And uh, we're glad to have you here today. Another version, Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jean's worship at the cottage. And we're glad to have you. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pinner. Uh, this is our, our weekly ministry to you guys, and we just uh, thank you so much for showing up and being with us. Especially if you're joining us via the internet, we're always honored that you take time wherever you are. We literally stream around the world, and we have people from all over the United States that uh, join us on a regular basis, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. If you uh, ever miss us on Sunday morning, we have a YouTube channel, Jesus Apostrophe N. Uh, jeans and uh, you can go on there and, and all of our, our messages are, are archived. Wanted to uh, wish everybody a, a happy 4th of July. Hope you've so far had a very safe and a very healthy uh, 4th of July. You know, yesterday our, our country became 244 years old. Now, that seems like a long time, but when you compare it to some of the other countries around the world, we're, we're still a baby. And uh, did you realize that the, uh, the original 13 colonies were created by 1733? You know, after Columbus came over, uh, the, the Spaniards, the Brits came over and started uh, laying claim to a lot of the property. And we of officially sealed our independence on July 4th, 1776. And according to the government, government Census Bureau back then, the population was 2.5 million people. <laughs> Today we've grown to over 330 million people. And we're behind China and India. We're, we're one of the largest uh, countries in the world. <coughs> Yesterday uh, was, was kind of a kind of a strange 4th of July, I think, as, as we view our Independence Day uh, through the eyes of a pandemic and some of the things that are just going on in our nation. And um, it was uh, it, it was kind of a, a surreal type of 4th of July for me. I, I don't know. It was, uh, we didn't see a lot of people out, you know, as I performed around the area. Uh, people, I guess, decided to stay home and, or go out on the lake. I know up where we live now in Blairsville, there's a lot of people that go hiking and and that kind of thing. And, and I, I just started thinking through how blessed we really are as a nation. And as we look at, at, at those who would seek to destroy who we are as a country, as a nation, um, I, 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 I just started thinking through some different ideas. And I, I found a piece that I want to start our service off today by reading. And... Uh, it's written by Max Lucado, who's one of my favorite authors. And when we think about it, when we see all the, the people, the right, the left, the Republicans, the Democrats, the conservatives, the liberals, and I tell you all the time, it's not about any of that. You know, people can, they can work as hard as they want to to remove monuments and try to destroy our history, but the thing is, is that you cannot destroy history. Because history stands for his story. It is his story throughout the ages. We're, we're, a, we're a drop in the ocean compared to God's ultimate plan. And when we get to a place to where we think we're so elite and so smart and so sharp that we can determine our destiny and decide on which is the right side of history, the wrong side of history. There's neither a right or wrong. It's just his story. <laughs> it's his story. And we exist as a nation because of him. Amen. Amen. And I wanted to share this with you this morning. Every national privilege can be traced back to the hand of God. If we have liberty, we can thank the one who came to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's Luke 4, 18. If we enjoy a robust economy or a high tide of justice, we don't limit our thanks to senators or the Supreme Court. We thank God. 
tally this up. God makes the boundaries. He determines the leaders. He dispenses the blessings. And America exists by the power of God. Can we afford to forget this? Can we afford to sever this single silver strand that supports the whole framework of our republic? Only at terrible risk. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. That's Deuteronomy 8, 19. America, God says, you exist by my power. That's the first reminder. But God doesn't stop there. A second reminder commands our attention. America, you exist for my glory. Recall what God said through the prophet Ezekiel. He said, I will demonstrate my glory among the nations. That's Ezekiel 39, 21. God does not need the United States in order to advance his cause. He lobbies no country and depends on no government. No, for all the nations of the world are nothing in comparison with him. They are but a drop in the bucket, dust on the scales. He picks up the islands as though they had no weight at all. The nations of the world are as nothing to him. And in his eyes, they are less than nothing. Mere emptiness and froth. That's what Isaiah 40, 15 tells us. Suppose, just suppose, God's glory became America's prayer and priority. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. That's Psalm 115, 1. Suppose our elected officials daily ask, how can we honor God in our decisions? How can this school introduce students to God? How can this army pr promote the name of God. Remember who manages the hearts of rulers, who prompts the decisions of kings. God does. God can change a nation. For that reason, we must pray and pray with all of our hearts that America would turn back to God. Because that's where our founding fathers began. Our educators now, we used, to, we used to label our time B.C. and A.D. Anno Domini. B.C. before Christ, the year of our Lord after His birth. Our educators have since changed that to B.C.E. Before the current era. <laughs> And now A.D. is C.E., the current era, in their effort to remove Christianity from the face of our nation. Help us, O oh God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive us our sins for your name's sake. Psalm 79 night.
sins and my sorrow. He paid them his very hell. He bore the burden to carry and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my song shall ever be.
have a very special prayer request uh, this morning. Sandra, one of uh, her close friends in uh, Dothan, um, she's uh, the daughter of Pastor Holt, uh, their pastor in Dothan, who is uh, 96 years old and still preaching the gospel every yeah. Sunday morning. Yeah. Woo! yeah. <laughs> <sighs> something to look forward to, doesn't it? Absolutely, brother. That's, that's a retirement plan that you can look forward to. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Looks like y'all gonna be coming here for a while if the good Lord has favor on you. <laughs> but uh, Pastor Holt's daughter, her name is Marcia, and uh, we want to pray for Marcia and her family. Her husband, uh, John Hankey, uh, is uh, the doctors still don't know what's wrong with him. They don't know physically what's wrong with him, but his uh, his days are, are dwindling away, and uh, they finally come to a place to where they they've accepted that and. Uh, and so we just want to pray a, a, a very special prayer for John Hankey this morning. Um, and in his final days, that, that the Lord is, is truly his focus. I'm sure it is. Sure, uh, Brother Holt's going to be right there uh, <laughs> helping him step right into glory. And uh, but we want to pray for Marcia as well. She, um, she's having a, a hard time with that as anyone would. And so we want to lift her up continue to pray uh, Jan's got a, another surgery coming up we, we were very excited about uh, uh, the, the news last week that uh, there's no lymphoma no cancer but uh, we still got one more little procedure to, to go through uh, before it's all done and uh, so please keep her in, in your prayers and just uh, pray for our nation pray for our leaders uh, continually uh, we need it more today than ever Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for another day to be able to gather together on this mountain as your children, to worship you truly in spirit and in truth. Come Holy Spirit, come into this place, come into our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out, God. Prepare us to engage the world around us with your story. The impact of what you being in our lives has done for us. Help us to see the world through your eyes that we might be able to offer grace and mercy and compassion in areas, especially for me personally, Lord, that I just struggle with. It's not always the easiest thing for, for me to do. And if there are any here that are like me, Lord, I pray that you change them as well we love you lord we thank you for this day we it's it's my favorite time of the week to be able to gather with believers and to proclaim your gospel your story bless us today oh lord forgive us where we fail you strengthen our walk draw us close to you we pray these blessings in the most powerful name your son jesus and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, you, everybody's familiar with this phrase. Don't worry. What? Be happy. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Put on a happy face. Turn that frown upside down. Don't be sad. Choose happy. Hope your day is a happy one. Have a happy day. Those are the, the sayings that we hear all the time, that we've heard many times throughout the years. We want people to be happy. We want to see a smile on their face. I mean, really, how many times have you heard, don't worry, be sad? <laughs> Put on a sad face. Now, some of you need to tell your face that you are happy, because I see some of you look like that. You go, you don't look happy? Well, I am happy. Well, you need to tell your face. <laughs> Hope you have a really sorrowful day today. Choose to be grief-filled. You see, there aren't too many sayings that 
direct us or encourage us to be sad. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That is, other than what Jesus said in the Beatitudes that we were studying, that we're going to be discussing today. You see, we, we began this series last week about the Beatitudes, and, and we talked about the first one in Matthew 5, 3. We said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this morning, I want us to talk about the next thing that Jesus said as he began the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he said in Matthew 5, 4, he says this, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Hmm. Blessed are those who mourn? Really? I mean, that is so opposite of anything that we would think. We, we, we think blessed are those who are happy. We, we think blessed are those who are, are healthy, but blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't sound like being blessed to me, does it to you? I mean, what in the world does Jesus mean by this statement? Well, we're going to examine this a bit this morning. And we're going to look at it a little bit closer so that we can better understand what he means and to be able to experience the comfort that he talks about. To start, I want us to understand the meaning of the terms and then ask some questions about what we can expect to find in comfort when we mourn and, and when we can't. Let's begin by... Remembering, last week we, we talked a little bit about how we define the word blessed. And, and blessed in this context we talked about, we defined as having and experiencing God's approval. And so blessed equals having and experiencing God's approval. That he looks down on us and he goes, well done. You know? And in experiencing God's approval... We, we talked a little bit last week. It, it's, a, it's, it's a great blessing. It's a great feeling. We, we talked about it by getting the approvals from someone. You know, when someone comes up and says, great job, nice job. Yeah, hey, man, that was awesome. Makes us feel good, doesn't it? It makes a, a great feeling inside. And the next word that I want us to define is the word mourn. Mourn means to express grief or sorrow. Or regret. Now, we understand mourning normally in the context of someone dying, someone passing away, but, but we can mourn or express grief and sorrow and regret over many, many things besides just the death of someone. I mean, we, we can grieve that, that maybe we didn't get the promotion at, at, at work or or, or we can regret uh, and mourn uh, an action that we've taken or words sometimes that we've used to hurt someone that have consequences that we don't want to experience. Maybe a, a marriage that ends in, the, in divorce. We, we grieve and we regret. We mourn. Or, or maybe a business venture that results in a, in a financial loss. We, we regret. We grieve. We mourn. But we do not only mourn due to death, but a loss or a feeling of loss of, of any kind. So using the definitions that we've established, the phrase would, phrase would read something like this. Having and experiencing God's approval are those that express grief, sorrow, or regret. For they shall be comforted. Now, did you get that? Having and experiencing God's approval in our life are those who express grief and sorrow or regret, for they shall be comforted. And so the question that I want us to ask today is, the first question we might ask is, how can we have and experience God's approval as we express our grief, our sorrow, and our regret? And the second question would be, how are we comforted through that? 
Let me offer you several suggestions here. A, God's approval begins with our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. I believe that as we, as believers, as His children, I believe that we can have and experience God's approval in our mourning, in our, our grief, our, our regret, our sorrow, through our relationship, that personal relationship that we have with the Lord. It, it's been my experience in pastoral counseling and especially working many years in, uh, in recovery ministry that those without Christ just end up medicating themselves in some fashion to alleviate the pain they experience from loss. Now, can that happen in the life of a believer? Absolutely, it sure can. You see, when we allow our focus to drift, drift away from our relationship with Christ, when we focus more on self than on the Savior, when we ignore the working of the Holy Spirit in us as we grieve or regret or face sorrow, we become vulnerable to what I call stinking thinking. <laughs> Psalm 1, 1 through 3 from God's Word translation says this. Blessed is the person who does not follow the advice of wicked people, take the path of sinners, or join the company of mockers. Rather, he delights in the teachings of the Lord and reflects on his teachings day and night. He is like a tree planted beside streams, a tree that produces fruit in season and who, whose leaves do not wither. He succeeds in everything he does. You see, when you look at the Beatitudes, there's a definite order in the structure of how Jesus listed each one of them. Each one flows from the other ones that went before. And, and just like the steps of recovery, one step flows out of and into the other step, the next step. There, there are two metaphors that illustrate this process that I want to share with you and use this morning that I hope will give you a better idea. The first illustrates the, the stages of the growth of a plant. It, you'll find that the first three Beatitudes that we're going to look at deals with our need. And these are the roots. These are the roots of a blessed and a godly life. And so the roots produce what? The roots produce shoots. And, and the shoots eventually bear leaves. And the leaves bear fruit. And the Bible says that we as believers are to bear fruit. Not only just bear fruit. Well, there's, there's old Teddy's fruit out there. Right? <laughs> That's uh, going to be low hanging. That's right. It's going to be on the ground here pretty soon. Now the Bible says to create fruit. Fruit that remains. Fruit that remains. That makes a difference. That impacts the world around you. Spiritual fruit. The second metaphor is that of concentric circles. You ever taken a rock and you just throw it into a pond or a little lake or something and as soon as it, it hits from the center of where that rock goes in the water, you have the concentric circles that form one from the other. The bigger the rock, the bigger the circles, the bigger the waves. The Christian life is much like that. As we dive into our relationship with Christ, each circle propels us to the next step and then the next and the next until we become what the Bible calls mature in Christ. We're no longer just drinking the milk. We're chewing on the meat of God's Word. 
And I want, I want you to get those metaphors because that is what God has called us to be as Christians. Is that we are continually growing. We are bearing fruit, spiritual fruit that impacts the world around us. It's only in the midst of that relationship with the living God that we will find any comfort as we mourn, as we grieve, as we regret or face sorrow. Martin Luther once uh, had a dream where he was in his house and he saw Jesus coming up the walk toward his door. And Luther started examining his surroundings and realized that everything in his house was just an absolute mess. Clothes were thrown all over the furniture and old food was sitting out. Trash was everywhere. And he thought, how am I going to let the Lord of life, Jesus Christ, come into a mess like this? He hurriedly tried to straighten up. But before he could pick anything up, the greater the mess became as he tried to get things up and pick it up. And Luther just resigned himself to the mess and Finally, he opened up the door as Jesus knocked and he said, Jesus, come on in if you think you can. If you think you can really come into a place like this, come on in. And as Luther turned, he saw that everything had been put into order. Everything in its proper place. The house was immaculate as Christ entered in. He said, oh, people that we, we make such a mess of our, our lives when we try to straighten them out by ourselves. But if we will submit to Jesus, if we will open our heart to Him, He will make us immaculate. He will clean us up from the, from the inside out, as I say all the time. Giving the Holy Spirit room to comfort and guide and establish us as a new creation. He does that every single day if we'll let Him. B, God's approval also depends on having the proper perspective as we mourn. It's always tough to face difficult times, but when you face it with the proper perspective, I believe that as we mourn, we, we must mourn with the right perspective, the proper perspective in mind. Because by doing so, we will be able to recognize God's provision in the situation. So what do I mean by that statement? I believe that as we grieve, we ask the question, God, what are you up to? What, what are you doing in my life right now as I go through this grief or this regret that I'm experiencing right now? What are you up to, Lord? Because it's more than just the loss of a loved one or a job or a marriage that fails or a business that doesn't make it. There's more to that. There's God's provision in each one of those areas that we have to tune into because God has a greater purpose. There are things that happen in our lives that God allows for a reason. And if we don't have the proper perspective, we can miss God's provision for us as we grieve, as we mourn. An example of this is found in Scripture when David, David's son Absalom, sought to kill David to overthrow him. And, and David at first began to mourn the death. When he heard about the death of Absalom, he began to mourn the death of Absalom without recognizing how God had protected him and his family and ultimately the nation of Israel. 2 Samuel 19.1 says this, Joab was told, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And, and for the whole army, army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. 
Because on that day, the troops heard it said, the king is grieving for his son. And even though David mourned the loss of his son Absalom, he did so with an improper perspective on the truth of his situation. And so Joab has to go to the king. He goes to the king to remind him of how his life and the lives of his family and, and, and the army and ultimately the nation of Israel had been protected that day with the death of Absalom. In 2 Samuel 19, 5 through 7, it says, Today you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. Ever experienced that in your life? You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come upon you from your youth till now. It's pretty bold words to speak to the king. But did he need to hear it? Absolutely. Now again, we can understand David mourning his son. We have a love for our children even when they do wrong. Amen. But, but David at first failed to recognize God's provision and blessing upon him. And after being rebuked by Joab, he comes out even amid his mourning to honor his men, to recognize that God had protected and provided for him and for his family even in the midst of the death of his son. The same is true for us as we mourn. It's difficult to lose a loved one. Any situation, a job, a goal, a dream. It's difficult. But God's provision for us is always aimed at bringing us through the valley. His aim is never the intent of just leaving us there to grieve as those who have no hope. His aim, his intention is always to bring us through the valley. And so the second question that we ask is how are we comforted through all of that? Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 3 and 4. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So how are we comforted? Well, A, we're comforted when we're honest about our own struggles. Sometimes that can be just as simple as recognizing our own unbelief when we're facing hard times. It's being able to say, hey, I, I don't have it all together. And I don't. I don't have it all together. I struggle, and I've been doing this for a long time. I, I struggle with trying to apply all that I think I know and understand about God and His Word. And again, it's not my first rodeo. I've been doing this a long time. But there are things that happen that, that drives unbelief in my heart. You know, I just, I can't believe it. I find myself, God, I, I can't believe I'm going through this. can't believe this is happening in my life. Andrew Murray, the great 
old pastor writes, he says, never mourn over unbelief as if it were only a weakness which you cannot help. As God's child, however weak you may be, you have the power to believe for the Spirit of God is in you. You have only to keep in mind this. No one apprehends, no one grasps, no one apprehends anything before that he has the power to believe. Before you recognize that you truly have the power to believe, it's almost impossible to grab hold of a truth. He goes on, he says, he must simply begin and continue with saying to the Lord that he is sure that his word is truth. God, I don't understand it all. I don't know that I believe it all. But I say this day, I am sure that your word is the truth. And, and Andrew Murray says he must hold fast the promise and rely upon God for the fulfillment. Does that make sense? That's how we are comforted when we mourn. I heard someone give an illustration once about a, a wooden well bucket that they came upon. He said, at first I thought this was just useless at first. Because it had been sitting next to the barn in the, in the sun and it was unused for a long time. He could, he could see daylight between the wooden slats of the bucket and certainly this thing would never hold water again. But an older man with him tied the bucket to the well rope and he let it drop in the water below. And In a couple of days they came back and turned the crank on the well to draw the bucket back up and and it was full of clear, cool well water. And it wasn't leaking a drop. The water had rehydrated the wooden slats until they fit together as originally designed. And the bucket was useful again. Friends, no matter what you're facing now. No matter what you've been through in your past. You're never out of God's reach. You're never too far for His unending love and His grace toward you. And being honest about your own stuff allows room for the Holy Spirit to raise you up and to point you in the direction of Christ and to restore your soul to be used for His glory. The second part of that, the B, is that not, not only are we honest about our own struggles, but we also look beyond our own circumstances. When we're troubled, when we're in mourning, we have a God whose promise is to comfort us through His Spirit. And even as He comforts us, He does that so that we can comfort others. Therefore, when, when we continue to, to meet like this, when we continue to be part of the body of Christ, when, 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 when we're going out of our way to not only receive the comfort of the Spirit, but also to share that comfort with others as they go through trials, as they go through troubles, it says that we will also be able to reach out and comfort those through everything that we go through. It's the old saying that we're blessed to be a what? We're blessed to be a blessing. And we truly are. It's not just an old saying. God has comforted us in such a way through our trials and our tribulations and our troubles so that we can comfort others because we've been there. A path is only a path because someone went before you. 
Other, otherwise, you're just beating down the weeds. You're just lost in the weeds. But when you have a path to follow, when you have someone who's been there, who can relate to your situation, don't you find it easier to make that journey? I heard the story of a young man and his wife. They used to live next door to a poor couple. They had a, a little girl who was around five years old, and the couple knew that she didn't have many toys, and they often saw her playing in the backyard by herself. And one day the young man went to the neighbor and he explained that, that the church where they attended at the time had some toys left over from a previous year's Christmas toy drive. And he very unassumingly asked the little girl's father if he would like some of the leftover toys for his daughter. And the, the father was pleased to receive them. And in truth, there really were no leftover toys. Though there had been a toy drive. You see, the couple went to the store and they, they filled a, a shopping cart filled with toys and clothes. And they themselves didn't have a lot of money and it was a sacrifice for them to do it. It was a sacrifice that was well worth the cost because one day the young man and his wife saw this little girl skipping to school carrying the doll that they had bought her. And they were both moved to tears. And though the little girl had been blessed, they had been blessed so much more. Because they had been used by God as agents of mercy and had been part of a conspiracy of kindness. You know, as, as we go through this series, I believe that the Beatitudes are biblical truths that can be applied to our lives today, right now. This morning, we, we've looked at mourning and and, and the comfort that we are promised as God's children. And we've learned that it's important for us always to keep our perspective on God's provision for us. We've also learned His ability to comfort us and care for us during difficult times. We've also realized the, the hope that He has made available to each one of us through His Son, Jesus Christ. However, you, you may be here today or you might be watching us over the internet through our, our streaming of, of our service. And you may be saying, you know, Teddy, I really don't, I don't have that kind of comfort that you're talking about. And in fact, you might even say, I'm not sure about my relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me assure you this morning that the Holy Spirit, if you will give Him a chance, the Holy Spirit has the most wonderful, loving way to help you get the answers to the questions that you might have. You know, we... We've all heard these scenarios. You, you know the stories that you hear all the time. Good news and bad news, aphorism, aphorisms. You, you've heard those. Well, that's good news. Well, no, that's really, that's bad news. Well, the good news is, well, you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> well, let me share you one today that has a little different twist to it. This is the bad news, the good news, and the best news. Let me share the bad news with all of you. You're dying. <laughs> You're dying. It's no joke. Bio biology, biologists tell us that every day, to some extent, each of us are dying. The cells and atoms in our bodies are dying. In fact, 
every atom and every cell that is now in our bodies will die off within the next seven years. In essence, we are experiencing a daily dying of our physical being. The good news is you're being restored. Just as the cells and the atoms in our bodies are dying, likewise new ones are being created to take their place. It's my understanding, and I make no claim to be a biologist. <laughs> this process makes a complete transition every seven years. And so, in one way, every seven years, you completely become a different person. <laughs> Why can't you see it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So when someone tells you, you know, you're not the same person that you used to be. Well, the whole idea of that has a lot of truth to it. Because you're not the same person you used to be. The whole idea of our bodies continually dying and being restored is really a, a rather refreshing thought. But even with the good news that we're being restored, we will eventually taste physical death. That's the bad news. But the best news, the best news is that you don't have to wait seven years to be made a new person. And the best news is that this time, this new person that you can become through Christ will live forever. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that whoever, whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. A, a new way of living has come into existence. You see, finding God's comfort is based on faith in Christ alone. It's not based on what you think. It's not based on our own self-interest. It's based on Christ alone. And Romans 10.9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, that you will be saved. Not might be. Not maybe on a good day if you're a good boy and girl. If you confess and believe, you will be saved. So do you want to experience comfort in your grief, in your regret, or in your sorrow? Confess Jesus Christ as Savior. Receive Jesus and recognize that you today can be comforted by the spirit of comfort beginning right now. If you are willing to do that, wherever you are, God will meet you right there. And He will change you from the inside out. And He will help you through every obstacle, every trouble, every trial that you face. And you will be comforted. I pray that you'll make that decision wherever you are, whoever you are. If you do that, contact us. Either through the cottage vineyards here we have a, an email on the screen we have several ways of getting in touch with us we will do anything that we possibly can to help you take that journey amen, amen. let's pray together our father we do thank you lord that you do help us through troubled times that your word 
is so powerful, so true. It, it, sharper than a two-edged sword, Lord. Your word tells us that it cuts straight through the marrow. It gets rid of all the gray areas. It speaks truth to our lives and it empowers us and strengthens us to walk with you as a new creation. I pray, God, that you will help us in that area that when we do mourn, when we do grieve, when we do face sorrow and trials and tribulations, that we'll get out of the way and let the power of your Holy Spirit rule the day, rule our thoughts, our emotions, strengthen us, God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank you for coming.